Welcome everyone. I'm Nancy Lorm Adams and I'm delighted today to introduce my friend and NWDC member, Nancy Megan Corwin. Nancy lives here in Seattle and has for many years. And she also has a wonderful little place up on Whidbey Island, which is where I live, which is north of Seattle. Um, she's been a member of NWDC since 2008. And not long after she became a member, she became the president of the organization from 2010 through 2012. And we were very thankful to her for her work as the leader of NWDC during that time. Just some background about Nancy. Um, she received her BFA in art and ethnomusicology from Eckerd College in Florida and her MFA in Metal Arts from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's an internationally known artist specializing in techniques of chasing and repose. She's the author of Chasing and Repose Methods Ancient and Modern, which was published in 2009. And it was also published in the UK and China and is sold internationally. And I believe you can find it on Amazon. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Um, I even have it and downloaded it, and read it myself. So um, in 2008, she received a GAP grant from Artist Trust in support of this project. Her work is in the permanent collections of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, State University uh, Museum in London, State University of New Mexico at Las Cruces Gallery, at the Tacoma Art Museum, and she's in many, many private collections, and she's on the neck and um, with people here in the room. So lots of people have her work. She shows locally at um, the uh, Ficheri Gallery, which is now part of the Green Lake Gallery um, stores, one in Bellevue and one over by Green Lake. And she's taught quite a bit locally through Danica and used to travel around the country tra uh, teaching as well. But of course, the pandemic has gotten in the way of a lot of that. Um, she was the pro assistant professor and head of jewelry and metals department at the University of Oregon Department of Fine and Applied Arts from 1989 to 1994. So she's got a lot of teaching experience. She's been in Metalsmith Magazine and Ornament Magazine 2000 and 2009, respectively, and was even on the corner of Ornament and I, uh, the cover of Ornament. And I know that that's a real honor. I'm sure that was a very special moment for her to have that article. So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce our dear friend, Megan Corwin. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you and thank all of you at NWDC for the chance to present my work and talk with you. Especially after all these years, I feel like, you know, we're back in communication. We can see each other and occasionally we can even be together. It's really special. And I wanna thank Daniel and Lois and Catherine and Denise for all the technical assistance. This is a um, unusual way to present a, a lecture and they've worked out all the bugs, so it should go well. Thank you very much. I'm going to start to screen share now. OK. The title of my talk is Evolution of a Maker and a Storyteller. And I've been a storyteller for a long time, but I haven't shared that with a lot of the people who know me as an artist. I'm going to start out by telling you about my background. But the first thing I want to say is that although most of my work has been in jewelry and small metals, I consider myself a sculptor in both formats. As you will see in these slides, I work with a variety of materials. Each piece I make tells a story. Some of these stories are held within the work itself and have a deep connection to process. Some are more obvious. All are meant to invite the viewer to create their own story as they experience the piece. Storytelling and art were an inherent part of my experience growing up. My sister is a short story and novella author, and my mother was a poet. My father drew and cartooned, and my aunt was a painter. My grandmother was a seamstress and tailor and taught me to sew from the age of five. We all shared a passion for creating and telling stories with our creations. 
We lived in Solberry Township in the Pennsylvania countryside surrounding the town of New Hope, nestled on the banks of the Delaware. Eccentric and beautiful, New Hope has always attracted artists, writers, musicians, and actors. It is halfway between New York and Philadelphia and consequently a convenient place for a weekend retreat from the city. New York artists congregate there to develop ideas and inspire each other. Alternative lifestyles were and are part of the fabric of the community there. When I first moved to New Hope, the town was still small and the only businesses were Abbott's ice cream store, a hardware store, and a head shop with some nifty bongs. The only doctor in town lived in this Victorian mansion and was a big game hunter. For a young child, his waiting room filled with trophies of antelopes, bears, and cougars was even more terrifying than the visit to the doctor himself. New Hope is famous for its haunted houses and woods. Phillips Mill Inn, which you can see the bottom left, has one of the oldest and most tenacious ghosts. Even now, tourists come to stay and hope for her to appear. You can imagine what kinds of stories we shared about her as kids. On the right-hand side, I have a picture of the bridge that connects Pennsylvania to New Jersey, New Hope to Lambertville. It's a very beautiful river, the Delaware, and I enjoy growing up near it and um, being able to boat in it and water ski in it. Like many of my classmates, I worked at the Bucks County Playhouse in the summers. Situated between Main Street and the Delaware River, it was and still is a popular place to debut shows headed for Broadway. Actors such as Grace Kelly, Robert Redford, and Liza Minnelli have performed in this charming off, off, off Broadway theater. Everywhere, artists were telling their stories. We were very lucky to live near George Nakashima. I'm sure many of you have heard of him, of course, the master artist in wood. He lived down the road from my best friend and we often passed his place, hidden in the woods and very mysterious. My parents loved his work and bought a whole dining room set, table, eight chairs and a sideboard. I lived with this elegant and beautifully functional work for years and loved it always. Nakashima's connection to the wood from choosing the tree and selecting the exact boards to use resonated with me. The feeling of the wood working with it and not against it was evident in all that he made. The sense of communication with the materials of his art is how I feel about the way I work metal. The story of the art flows from this interaction. I like this quote from his writings about his philosophy. Instead of a long running and bloody battle with nature to dominate her, we can walk in step with a tree to release the joy in her grains, to join with her to realize her potentials, to enhance the environments of man. <laughs> After high school, I entered Stetson University in Deland, Florida to study piano in a warm and what I considered an exotic place. I quickly discovered that hours in a practice room alone were not for me. I signed up for a drawing class with Gary Nofke. He was new to the school and hired to teach drawing and design. Halfway through the course, he told us we were the worst drawers he had ever experienced and that we could choose between metals and ceramics for the rest of the term. He showed us slides of both, not telling us that all the metal work was his. We all chose metals. The minute I touched a piece of silver, I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I love every part of metalworking, discovering the potential in a sheet of silver and working with the response, reacting to the results. I owe my life's work to Gary's unorthodox decision to follow his passion rather than the school's rules. I earned my MFA from Madison, Wisconsin, working with Eleanor Modi and Fred Fenster. I was searching for my focus, a little lost as many graduate students are, when Eleanor attended a workshop with Satso Ando, on the techniques of chasing and repose. He was touring the US teaching workshops for instructors at major colleges and universities because he worried that these traditional techniques were being lost in Japan from a lack of interest. Eleanor shared what she learned with us. I took to these techniques right away. They helped me to find the organic core hidden in that sheet of silver and to develop my own voice in my art practice. I discovered what artisans have known for centuries, that these processes allow for the kind of repetition and meditation that gets you closer to the beautiful connection and flow 
that is the intersection of the hand, mind, and material. The techniques of chasing and repousade do not only exist in Japan. They are thousands of years old and can be found in many cultures around the world. Chasing refers to texturing or detailing the front side of a sheet of formed or formed piece of metal using a rod of steel or some hard material and a hammer. The chasing tool has a different shaped ends for making different kinds of marks. This artisan is texturing the surface of a group of large spoons. Although these are multiples of the same design, she's putting her individual mark on each as she hand works the surface. Repose refers to forming or punching up the backside of the sheet to create a relief that is then chased for detail and texture. I've done a lot of traveling and I've met a lot of chasing and repose artists around the world. This artisan was one of my favorite experiences. Friends of mine and I traveled to Greece and went to visit a little town we had heard was the town of the silversmiths. We found that most people had not heard of the town of Yanina and were surprised they were going there, but it was everything we could have hoped for. As we entered the town, we could hear a tap, 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 and exactly the rhythm that a chasing artist makes with their hammer, a special kind of tap. And we found the workshop of this fifth generation chasing and repose artisan. As we were watching him, we realized that there was no common language except the language of chasing and repose. And as he was working, he caught me looking and asked if I was a tool maker as well. Most chasing and repose artists make it at least some of their own tools. I said yes, and through this special language of chasing and repose, he invited me to spend a month with him fixing his tools. That was extremely tempting, and I still wish I could have worked that out. This is Brian Clark of County Wicklow, south of Dublin, Ireland. Uh, he, when I visited him, he showed me this very clever stool to hold his pitch pot so that he can spin it and get to all parts of the vessel. This inspired me to get piano stools to put my bowl on. Chasing and repose can be performed with the humblest of tools as well. A ball peen, hammer, and wooden base is all this chaser from India needs. Davide Bagazzi is a well-respected chasing and repose artist who lives half the time in his home of Italy and the other half in the Bay Area. He learned his craft as an apprentice at the age of 14. Bill Reed was a member of the Haida's First Nations people. His work in many materials is astonishing. He's famous for the following statement, which resonates with me every day in the studio. Joy is a well-made object, equaled only by the joy of making it. I visited Santa Clara de Cobre in the province of Michoacan, Mexico many times, specifically to watch this masterful family chase and repose their extraordinary work. They don't use pitch for these big bowls instead or vessels, they use stakes and hammers. If anybody's interested in this particular approach, please ask me after the lecture. Abdon Pancho Angel, and I don't pronounce that correctly, I know I apologize, is the patriarch and living treasure of this family. Here he's holding the roughed out form that will become a finished vessel like the one he is holding on the right. I bet you recognize this. This is the workshop where they built the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty is the largest piece of repose in the United States. It's made of sheets of copper, three thirty seconds of an inch thick and hammered into wooden forms with various kinds of large hammers from forging hammers to chasing hammers. And this is the end result. Even into the wood, the chasing and repose artists were able to create this kind of detail. And the different sheets of metal are riveted together. Teaching is something I'm passionate about. And teaching chasing and repose has always been one of my favorite subjects. However, over the years, I discovered that students did not have a textbook to help them with learning this process. And they really wanted one. So after being asked for one for many years and trying to get somebody else to do it, I had to end up writing that book. 
it was an interesting experience. It took three years and I didn't have a lot of time for studio work, but the end result has allowed me to travel the world and teach people in lots of different countries and lots of different states in the United States. It's been a thrilling experience and I greatly appreciate the response to it. It is both a technical book and a gallery book, meaning that there are a lot of images of chasing and represent artists work from around the world. So when the book came out, then uh, Ficheri Joy Art Gallery and Karen Lorraine asked me if I wanted to have a show of some of those artists. And this is called Metal Magic. It was a wonderful show. It was a chance to show the real pieces and not just the photos in the book. And this show traveled to Velvet Da Vinci in California. It also led to some interest in my work and a resurgence of interest in Chasing and Repose. And I was privileged to have this article appear in Ornament and another article in Metalsmith. A conversation with the metal. That's how I feel every time I am practicing Chasing and Repose and working on a piece. This is a sheet of sterling silver. Sterling silver is my preferred metal to work in because it is soft enough to do deep and wonderful organic forming, but it's hard enough. It's able to resist a little bit so that I can make crisp edges on those formed parts. And this is called a liner, this tool. I'm making a groove on one side and a raised line on the other. This is the front side of the metal. And this piece has been formed from the back side with the repose technique. And in this case, I'm using a punch to create some more forms from the front side. The end piece is inspired by my incredible lack of gardening skills. I am a passionate gardener and I garden all the time, but I don't know what it is. I don't have that green thumb. So my cabbages are always blowing up. They never stay nice and round. But I thought, well, I love the way they look blown up like that. And I was wandering around my garden one day and found a cabbage like that and saw that there was a little drop of water in the center. So this is inspired by that and the diamond is the little drop of water. The other thing that I'm passionate about is making tools. All Chasing and Repose artists who make tools understand the important relationship and the lovely relationship from the tools to the pieces that you're making. They are an extension of your hand but they all have different effects on the metal. So the tools on the right are ones I just, just made uh, mostly because I had a situation I needed to solve and something I wanted to do. And I knew in this case, I needed an oval round. In that case, I needed a texture tool, et cetera. On the left are a set of tools that I've designed that I think are very useful for doing the kind of repose work I do. And I'm um, lucky enough to have Bill Dawson be able to make them for me so that we can sell them at a reasonable price. And if you're interested, Bill Dawson, metalsmith.com is where you'd find that. Although I do encourage people who are interested to make their own tools. And this is some of what the tools can do. On the left, you can see how plastic, how malleable that metal is. And yet on the right, look at how sharp that is, how much of a sharp edge you can get. Those things inspire me greatly. So when I'm working on a piece like this, the forming is this organic and um, deeply meditative process so that I can make these raised areas that then I can go back and texture. And that's also a different kind of meditative process, overlapping the blows, overlapping the textures. Pieces like this, I often have a center focal point. And what I'm working on there is creating a sense of a radial asymmetry so that the stone becomes the focus and everything radiates and rotates around that. It, it is a way that I can achieve lots of different textures and forms and still have the piece seem whole. This is another one of those things based on my um, vegetable gardening. And this one is based on a kale that then overgrew and kind of exploded apart. And it also has a diamond in the center. These pieces, these brooches 
are all about the same size. They're all about three inches in diameter, and they run between a quarter inch and a half inch deep. They are made of 22 gauge sterling silver. And I find that the 22 gauge allows me to stretch the metal and make these deep forms, but at the same time allows them to be very wearable. They're light enough to wear comfortably. In a form like this, there's no stone in the center, but that is still a focal point and allows me to treat every area of the brooch differently in terms of the texture. This is the point at which I started to use or um, find that walking on the beach and walking on coast, because I try to go to the coast anywhere I can find one, uh, has affected my design ideas and inspiration. So you can recognize some elements that you might find at the beach, the shell, for instance, and some sandy areas. And of course, out here, there's a lot of raindrops, and uh, I included some of those as well. And this piece is a little simpler, but I think it's uh, really directly related to my experience on the beach. And a lot of the textures that I have in a brooch like this are made with tools that I make so that I can have, um, and I, I make them a lot of the time without knowing exactly what texture they're gonna make. And then I work with the piece, I hammer a little bit, see if I like the texture, and if I do, I continue on. And then after I'm done with this piece, I have a tool with this lovely texture that I can use on the next piece. And this piece, I believe, is the piece owned by Cynthia and Dan. And um, again, it is one of those pieces with a focal point in the center, allowing me to treat each area, each form on the brooch differently in terms of the texture. I like this one because it's a little softer than the other ones and just a little change of pace there. This one has a pyrite in the center. And again, it's all chased from one sheet of metal, all the things you've been seeing of one sheet of metal, except for the bezel that goes around the stone. In this case, I was thinking of fabric and the flowing of fabric and the fluting of it. These two pieces are radiating around a center stone. They're a little bit more about su subtle and matte finishes. In this one, I was really playing with the stone, playing off the stone with the textures that I had in this one. When I first moved here, a few years after that, I moved in 91, I started working for and showing at Ficheri Joy Art Gallery. That has shaped my life for over 20 years and I love that experience. I'm gonna go back to this for a little bit. The gallery was owned by Karen Lorene, is now um, moved on to uh, Green Lake Jewelry Works, but when it was owned by Karen, it was downtown in city center. And just this small glass kiosk of a place that held 50 artists from around the world. Karen was a wonderful advocate for art jewelry. She had a fantastic base of um, educated customers and collectors and the sweetest staff in the world. I loved my experience there and she was incredibly supportive. The other thing that Karen would do, she also is a storyteller. Karen is a novelist as well as being a promoter of art jewelry. And she liked to have shows, invitationals with a theme. So the invitational for this show was louder than words. And I interpreted that to mean this loud sound of various kinds of natural you might call them disasters, you know, hurricanes, things like that. So this is based on my time in Florida when I lived through a hurricane and the um, experience that I'd heard about, but I had never thought I was going to experience of having the eye of the storm come over and everything is blowing, it's wild, it's crazy. And then all of a sudden everything quiets down and there's this golden glow overhead. So that's what this piece is about. This one is larger than my usual ones, it's about three and a half across. Heart on Fire is about a volcano about to the erupt and the um, molten lava in the center. And the tornado coils, obviously a tornado and the effect it has on buildings. And I wanted to collaborate with uh, a writer and one of my friends, Susan Welch, is a wonderful poet. 
So I gave her the title of the piece. She saw the piece and she wrote a poem for it, which you see rolled up as a scroll here. And here is the poem. A tower of clouds erupts and spirals. The buildings disappear. Somewhere in there, ancestry is torn apart. The power lines howl. Debris falls like confetti from the sky. The storm plunges into the land like a kite with a dancing tail. The tornado coils over the prairie, spinning and rolling, no time to say goodbye. Karen also would produce something called Signs of Life, which was a beautiful magazine that she put out every year. And she would choose eight writers and eight art jewelers, and she would pair them up herself. She would show the writers a photograph of the art jewelry and tell them to write about the piece, not about jewelry. And I was honored to have her choose my sister to write about mine. So her name's Joan Corwin, and the title was At the Lake. Another show that Karen, uh, Karen put together, which is really wonderful, was when she was turning 70, called Celebrating 70. And she had 70 artists participate, and she allowed us to choose our year. Since I was working there, I got to be the first, and I chose 1969. That was the year that I graduated from high school, and it was also the year that we walked on the moon. To me, one of the most exciting things we've ever done. So this piece is a watch case that has a uh, chaste and represade element in the front of Buzz, Buzz Aldrin on the moon. And that is only one inch wide. As you can see, these pieces are not being represented on the screen at their actual size, but chasing and represade can be done very small and very large. And then inside that watch case, you find a pendant of the moon. And Cynthia and Dan own this one. And here the pendant is close up. To the left, you'll see a photograph of the moon, a picture of where the Sea of Tranquility is and the landing, lunar landing. And on the right is the silver disc that's one inch across in reality with the diamond right where they landed on the Sea of Tranquility. Another show was idiosyncratic. This was an opportunity for me to do something that was totally outside of my norm. And most of the artists interpreted that to mean the seven deadly sins. So I chose the sin of pride. And I have a collection of these porcelain dolls that come from um, Dresden where they make the porcelain dolls and the ones that they don't use, they throw out and people have been collecting them and selling them. So I gold leafed my dollies and put them with silver spoons. So my dollies are the best. And you can see that they have pearls and silver spoons. This dolly, my dolly went to the royal wedding because of course you can see she has one of those terrific hats. She's proud of that. My dolly is proud of her hat, is a ring. And the uh, Racine Museum, actually saw these dollies somewhere. I don't know where, I'm probably on Ficheri site. And had, and they were doing a show called White Gold, the appeal of luster, the appeal of luster, and asked me to participate. So this dolly got to go to the museum. My dolly is better than your dolly. And as you can see, she's got lipstick, a diamond in her navel, and a gold chain. And my dollies are wearing gold nugget jewelry. They are wearing gold nuggets. And the story behind that is that their father went out prospecting and he hit the mother load and came back and brought each of his girls a little nugget of gold and a gold chain to put it around their necks. Now, Karen also gave me one of the last two person shows. I was really thrilled to have that. And I made this necklace for it. And this is called Rose Petal Path. And it's based on yeah, I do a lot of walking through the woods, through the gardens, and um, I have a lot of roses. And the petals sort of fall to the ground and lay on each other and a, become a kind of light path. And I love the way they do that. So this is made of a multitude of petals in silver and four layers. So there's two layers on the top of petals facing up and two layers on the bottom facing down, and you can flip it over. But that's so that it will sit lightly off your neck. And um, and the 
druzy, the pink druzy quartz piece in the front comes off as a separate pendant. This design the same way only with leaves. And these neck pieces are maybe 20 inches across, 22 inches across. This one has folded leaf elements. And in this case, I wanted to do something that had another material involved. So every other leaf is covered in something called niello, which is a very old alloy of lead and sulfur and silver that creates a very beautiful deep black and most people polish it, but I left it crusty on the surfaces of these pieces so it was more organic. And this is the same with some of that niello. These pieces, I wanted to play with a shape being exactly the same and then taking it different directions. And so each one of these is the same square, the same size square of silver, but each one is chased differently. And you can see a close up here. I had to make at least four tools to do this piece, which was a joyful thing. And here is an oxidized version. I like the way these elements dance around and they almost seem like thorns to me, but um, twigs and thorns and things like that. This is called garden neck piece. This is the piece that's at the uh, Las Cruces Museum. And this piece, my goal was to make it like my walks through the woods where I see elements, leaves and plants and flowers and and berries falling to the ground and laying on each other lightly. And in this case, I did it by not putting a framework behind it. So each piece is soldered or joined to the other piece. And you can see a close up here. This piece was really fun. I've been on a lot of board of directors. I have to say that the NWDC board of directors is the very best one I've ever been on. Everybody was so nice and it's such a good time. Um, but this piece was all about a board meeting. And in this board meeting, there are various different personalities represented. So when I made this piece, I brought it into Ficheri and I left it in the case, went out to lunch and came back and a woman had bought it and she bought it because of the name and she recognized some of the board members. She had just come from a board meeting. Okay, I'm going to have to go a little bit faster. Um, at some point, we bought some property in Whidbey Island. Here's my son with my successful artichokes. And I became very influenced by Whidbey Island, about the trees and the textures. And so some of these pieces are really a response to what was around me. This is a brooch about three inches across, and it represents the, um, this is my take on the fallen trees. Another brooch about the trees. This is more about walking on the um, beaches with seaweed and stones. Uh, some of the foam that you find on the water and the beach, and here's a representation of that. Um, this is a bracelet called Coast, Coastal Path, just walking through some of the sand and, and uh, wood. And this is also a response to the beach. Um, this is a very quiet response with some textures that relate to the sand. And then this is, directly from my garden, various kinds of things that is growing inspired each one of these pieces. Lots of leaves and a variety of leaves, some more textured than others. And then um, of course I had to make a poppy pin, lots of poppies. And I really enjoy long pins as well. This is a hair pin and it's gonna show up a little bit later. This is also based on the moon which is something else that's beautiful to see from Whidbey Island. And it's the same pendant, it's just front view and back view, light side of the moon, dark side of the moon. Uh, another moon piece glowing in the sky. And then I decided that I really wanted to do some, some bottles or containers and I wanted them to hold scented oil. And these were really fun to do, they're very small. They're only about four inches, three inches, four inches high. And the oil didn't pour out that well out of the spouts, even though I enjoyed making them. So I decided that I would continue to make some containers while I thought about uh, how I could make the oil come out a little bit more easily. 
And that led me to this series, Hairpins and Oil Bottles. So each one of these bottles holds scented oil and the stoppers are all hairpins and they come out and they bring the scented oil to the hair. So this one um, has a smaller top. It's only about four inches high, a smaller uh, stopper. This one, I have some Cherokee in my background and I wanted to create something in honor of that. And that's the Cherokee language I etched on the outside of the bottle. But all of these are interactive. You take out the stopper, it brings the scented oil and you put it in your hair. Now, of course, you have to have a lot of hair, but not always because many of these are owned by a collector who has one inch long hair, but she really liked the pieces. This has nine separate stoppers. You can take out one or two or all nine and put them in your hair. And this one has one silver stopper at the top. This is called above and below because um, I'm always digging up in the garden and there's so much that exists below the surface of the soil. It's, we don't get to see unless we dig. And this one has a very large top and works very well with people who have a lot of hair. It is almost like a crown or a fan in the back of the hair. The conversation is a double-sided piece. The front and the back are slightly different and the band around the side connects them together. I believe the front and the back are having a conversation together. This piece is shaped. I have, I have some very unusual plants in my garden and I really like the form of the one you see on the left. And so this is shaped inspired by that form. And this one is inspired by the thistles that just always seem to grow out there. I actually love them. I think they're beautiful. I think the mandrake root is a very interesting plant and inspired this piece. And the leaves are highly represented and textured. I've done a lot of traveling in my life and one of the places I love the most is Rotnest uh, Island in Perth, Australia. It has the most beautiful rock formations and little tiny mussels and lovely seaweed and inspired this piece, which the outside is inspired by those shell-like rock formations. In the inside, I had to make a tool, I shouldn't say had because I loved it, that was a stamp that looked like a muscle. And that's how I did the muscles on the inside and then laid pieces of gold and fused them to the surface to represent the seaweed. I also like to play around with uh, larger pieces. And this is about 24 inches long, it's a ladle. And that's the inside, and this is the outside of the bowl of the ladle, which looks different in some ways than the inside. You, I like to have surprises on the other side of the pieces I work. This is a menorah called Ava, and it stands about, I'd say, 18 inches high, made of sterling silver, and the cups are 24 karat gold. This is a menorah I made for my son, Samuel, and this is a uh, it's a flat menorah. Each one of these elements is soldered to either each other or that, that stem that goes through the center. And it's copper, silver, brass, and gold. This piece was commissioned by Seymour Rabinovich. He was a very well-known collector of antique fish servers and cake servers. And then he decided to expand and invited 99, I think it wasn't exactly 100, um, artists from the United States and the UK to make a fish or, uh, or cake server. I chose fish because it matched my experience as a kid traveling, um, walking through the woods and following streams where different plant detritus was collected on the stream, on the water and floated through down the stream and got caught in various kinds of pipes. And the water was what continued on past the pipe. So you can see they're all piled up together, the different leaves and stems and things. And then the water is the blade of the server. So this piece has lots of different elements, but it also can be turned upside down and have its own individual look. 
Well, Karen came up with another show, Celestial Comets, Cupids, and Other Heavenly Bodies, and I interpreted that to mean the Milky Way. And I absolutely love stars in the Milky Way, and this is a piece that moves, it's articulated, it's plates of sterling silver and it has chain in order to catch the light and, and move like the stars on a Milky Way night. This one too. And this is just stars, as you can see, silver stars with uh, an agate stone. And a brooch that uh, I enameled and then I secured these different stars and starfish forms on top. This is called a Southern Constellation. Um, and so it's the constellation set that you would see in the Southern Hemisphere. And I made it out of mica in little cups of silver and a sheet of acrylic on top of each one that is drilled in this shape, the holes are drilled so that they match the constellation that it represents. So this is Scorpius, which is there on the Southern Hemisphere map. And as you can see, each one is a different constellation. I also do sculptures. And this sculpture set, set of what I call heads, is in response to um, a show at Cabrillo Gallery, and I call this Inside Out. These 11 sculptures are women with historically correct stories that, complete, that are completely invented. I was inspired to create this series by the death of my mother in 2001. She was a poet who never felt she fitted in with society. Many times I heard her voice, I heard her voice say what some or maybe all of us had said, or thought at one time or another, if only my hair looked good, I could face going out. I began to see women's hair as a kind of helmet. When acceptable for the time, a hairdo can hide a woman's true feelings. And this is Lady Lotus Flower. I invented her, but all of the history is correct. I do a lot of research. She is a well-known, well-renowned dancer and singer. Her kimonos are exquisite. Her hair is perfect. People make ornaments for her hair. But she is envied by the other geisha in um, geisha in training, the maiko, in the house, the geisha house, which is called an okia. They trick her. They try to trip her. They try to find ways to make her hurt herself or get confused and go to the wrong place. And she has tripped and poked her skin and bled onto her lotus flower that she wears in her hair. She feels all these eyes following her all the time. So slowly, her exterior is starting to slip, her calm, and her true thoughts are beginning to emerge through her hair for all to see. And that's what's common to all these sculptures. The women have the hairdo that's appropriate for the age, but eventually their true thoughts are starting to break through. Dorothy is an Amish woman. Isabel is from uh, Elizabethan times. And she was having an affair and the babies from this affair she could not keep and she tried to hide it but eventually they were coming through her hair lady samurai wanted to be a samurai but she was actually a geisha and stuck in that lifestyle and she was tired and upset about it and she couldn't hide her true feelings of wanting to be a samurai warrior and there was a, a, a woman samurai warrior it's very famous in japan Mother Hand of the Woods refers to the mother of the geisha house who's become very old and can't control her thoughts, which are growing like fungus on her head. Okay, the problem with color. The problem with color for me is that I always assumed that to get color on my work, I really had to go to enameling. Um, this piece is called Sunset and I like this piece. I enjoy the colors, but to tell you the truth, 
uh, I hope there are no enamelists listening. I didn't enjoy the process of enameling. It wasn't flexible enough. It had too many surprises for me to use. But I still want color in my work. And there's a couple of reasons why. So one of the things I learned making those sculptures is how to do something called sumami konsashi. And it refers to folded petal hair ornaments. And I've been practicing this technique for quite a while and discovered that it's a great venue for introducing color into my work. The other reason that I need color in my work is that I have a lot of arthritis and I might have come to the end of doing significant chasing and repose work. And like all of us, things change as we get older, but I still want to make work and I'm excited by the idea of color. And I'm also excited by the idea of fabric. Now, each one of these little petals is made from a half inch square of fabric, which I fold with a, a piece of tweezers and then glue to a sheet, as you can see here, they're, they're glued to either a piece of wood or a piece of um, paper, and then I paint them and gold leaf them, which is super fun. So this is what I'm working on now. I'm working on combining those Tsumami Kinsashi pieces with other elements that I've found and using pencils and using gold leaf, color pencils, gold leaf, and paint to work on these surfaces. And I'm finding it really satisfying. It doesn't mean that I'm never going to do any chasing and repose again. I just have to limit it. And now I can introduce color to it. Thank you very much. <laughs>